Okay, welcome everyone to Unimed's Innovation Week 2021. Um, we have a nice slate of virtual uh, panel discussions and events lined up for you this year. So just as a, a quick overview rundown, uh, today is prototyping resources within the university um, and within the Omaha community over the noon hour. Um, tomorrow will be adventures and starting up. It'll be a good panel discussion uh, with some faculty entrepreneurs and local ent entrepreneurs who've partnered with faculty to form university startups. Wednesday will be a panel on startup resources. Um, again, over the noon hour via Zoom, um, a panel that will discuss various resources for our faculty, whether that be small business grants or customer discovery programs, things like that. Um, uh, and then Thursday, obviously, is our innovation awards. So the highlight of the week, Thursday over the noon hour. Um, so we, we feel like we got some good events for you. Um, uh, we hope you join us and enjoy these events. You can also check these out afterwards. They're being recorded. You can find these on YouTube. So please share with anyone who missed out. Um, today we're joined by a great panel of prototyping uh, experts here at UNMC and UNO. So um, I'll do a quick introduction and then um, we'll open up with some, some questions for the panel, kind of one panelist at a time, and then hopefully have time at, uh, toward the end for questions. If you do have questions in attendance, uh, please submit through the, the chat. Um, or uh, when we do open it up to questions, you can also kind of raise your hand and you can get called on as well. So, okay, um, without further ado, we're joined by Dr. Brian Nahr, an assistant professor and the director of the Machining and Prototyping Corps in the Department of Biomechanics at UNO. Um, Dr. Nahr's Prototyping core facility um, does an excellent job. It's an excellent resource to have here. They, if, you, if you can dream it, they can basically build it. Hopefully I'm not overselling Dr. Nahr. <laughs> um, also happy to be joined by Dr. Bethany Lowndes, an assistant professor in the UNMC Department of Neurological Sciences and a human factors engineer. Um, as part of Dr. Lowndes' duties under the Great Plains IDEA CTR grant, uh, she serves as the health systems engineering liaison and actively pursues resources for inventive faculty, um, including engaging engineering students um, at the engineering college to work with our, 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 our faculty inventors on prototyping. Um, Dr. Or, uh, sorry, Brian Moss in the library uh, is an assistant professor and digital technologies librarian um, in, in the McGugan Health Sciences Library. Um, you can see him there in the Maker Studio, in the Linder Maker Studio. Um, as part of his duties, Brian helps organize and operate the Jim and Karen Linder Maker Studio and the Associated Making and 3D Printing and Healthcare Speaker Series. You can hopefully learn a little bit more about that too today. And then finally, uh, last but not least, Noah Wester. Noah is a 3D modeling technician um, at the Unitech Institute. So as part of his duties, he oversees a team of Metro Community College prototyping fellows to provide medical device prototypes for UNMC and UNO inventors. Um, so this is great that they're all sharing their time and expertise with us today, and we will jump right in. So speaking of expertise and skills, you know, a lot of our inventors are hesitant to reach out because they they don't know what they don't know, and they they're afraid of you know reaching out too soon or too early, um, or not having the right skills. So, um, starting with Dr. Nar, and then we'll just kind of move through. I'll call on you one at a time. But Dr. Nar, first, what does a university inventor, um, someone who wants to engage with your core facility, what do they need to know? What sort of skills do they need to have before they reach out? What does that sort of initial contact look like? Yeah. So. The most important thing for anyone reaching out to our core is that they have an idea, and that's pretty much all they need. Um, so uh, our core and our, our facility here at UNO Biomechanics kind of specializes in helping people who may, may not have the tools or the skills to make their idea a reality to do so. Um, typically, when, when an inventor or a, an idea comes across our plate, um, the first thing we do is meet as a team, either myself or one of our staff, um, with the inventor um, and discuss where are where are they with that project you know you know how well have they thought through that idea um, and what are they looking for you know as the next step oftentimes it's a, a back of the napkin idea or a concept um, that doesn't really have a clear path from the inventor for how to fabricate um, and that's in a lot of ways our specialty we're we're focused on being able to take an idea and determine whether it is feasible to make in the ways that it, the inventor thinks it can be made. Um, and then explain, here's how we would do it, and here's what it would cost. Um, in terms of uh, how we operate, we operate on 
the bill of materials and the time that it would take our staff to, to commit to um, finishing out the project or delivering that deliverable that we agree on. So in terms of skill sets, Tyler, um, you don't really need much of one. That's what we're here for. Um, but of course, you know, it, the more refined your idea, the more advanced your idea is to that kind of completion stage or that fabrication stage, the faster the project and the turnaround would likely be. If you come to us with you know, full CAD drawings and say, hey, we just need to print this or we need to fabricate this on you know, one of our CNC mills or lathes, um, the turnaround is much faster because now we're just worried about machine time and setup as opposed to um, the design time. So you don't need that skill. You don't need those um, you know, fully prepared drawings. We can do that. Um, but if you have it, certainly it you know, accelerates the timeline of the project, which is always nice. Yeah, it's been my experience too working with you, Brian. It's we can come to you with projects at various stages of development. So as as you said, as as early as just an idea or a concept or back to the napkin drawing, all the way up to already have it CAD modeled, 3D modeled, and now just need it physically prototyped. And so that you guys have been a great resource. Um, Noah, I'll kick it over to you, Noah. What uh, what's engagement with you look like? Again, what do inventors at the university? sort of need to have prepared? What sort of skills do they need, if any, before they can engage with you? And, and where can they typically find you? Okay, um, well, uh, similar to what Dr. Nahr was just talking about, uh, it, people come in with an idea and that's, that's the basic thing that they need. An idea and a willingness to work as a team to develop it and see it through. And uh, that idea could be really rough, uh, like was mentioned the back of the napkin and we recently had a, a back of the napkin contest where we actually solicited ideas on that level um that being said if it's if it's more advanced as well uh that's great we like meeting inventors where they're at and working with them if they've already thought through and done some initial cat drawings or something like that um as far as working with the mcc prototype design students um, that's the team that I work with and uh, basic ideas provide this excellent opportunity for them to work on real world problems. So having a rough idea is actually great experience for us. And I encourage people to reach out even if they're not really sure where this is going and, and haven't had the time to think it all the way through. So uh, this could be, um, university faculty or researchers who are coming up with an idea, but we also get uh, ideas coming in from the external community as Unitech work is a, uh, an entrepreneurial startup and um, accelerator and incubator. So we have those contacts within um, the community to solicit other invention ideas as well. All of that uh, works together to give the students just uh, excellent experience. And what we're looking to do maybe is uh, the more basic upfront design to maybe then hand off a project to experts like uh, Dr. Nahr and UNO. And we'd be making use of facilities both at MCC where they have a prototype design lab um, and also like what uh, Brian Moss is running over in the Guggen Library, which is an excellent maker studio, fully capable of uh, getting a rough design um, into a format like a 3D print or something to further the process of development. Perfect, thank you, Noah. And I know you spend quite a bit of time over in the Linder Maker Studio. Brian, you wanna describe what you have going on over there in that studio and how people can engage with it? Sure, the library, Last year finished a renovation where they doubled their size of their maker studio space and got quite a bit of new equipment. And it's primarily a do-it-yourself space. So to engage with it, you just have to want to come, um, come to us and, and the space is open for anybody. To use it specifically, you would have to make an appointment initially and we do like a safety orientation and then we put your scan card into the door and it's 24 seven after that. So the skills people would have to have really is just a desire to do things. And um, 
we, like I said, it's primarily do it yourself, but we're also glad to help where we can. I just can't guarantee you advanced knowledge of, of some programs and things. It's mostly, uh, I can point you towards things. I can show you what's worked before and answer questions. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I know you got a couple of good 3D printers over there. Are you available if someone makes an appointment with you then to help for, for anyone new to 3D printing to help kind of just show them how to upload a file and print it? Yeah, yeah. Through our, our website, we have just a booking system that always knows my schedule. So you can click onto that and it'll give you a list of times you can choose from. And um, like I said, initially, I'll, I'm glad to help. And then my, my goal is to make people not dependent on me. So they, they learn to take it on their own. And just a quick follow up to what hours um, is your studio accessible? Because I know, and I'm asking kind of selfishly too, I still need to do the, the safety orientation. <laughs> well, we're there just basic business times, eight to five, Monday through Friday for my help or my colleagues help. But the studio is open 24 seven, just like the library. So after hours, it's no library staff here, but if you have the ability to scan your card, you can come in and, and have access to the space and the tools. That is cool. Um, the first studio was not, the library was not open 24 seven. So that's a, that's a cool new feature. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, last but not least, Dr. Lowne. So we've talked about engaging with um, UNO, biomechanics students and engineers. Um, Noah has talked about engaging with Metro Community College students to do prototyping. You have a program going where you're working with engineering students um, through, the, through, through, through UNO, right? So. Can you talk a little bit more about that program and what it's like to engage with with that process? Yes, so we are um, looking for clients, folks that are have a design idea, have really a problem, a problem that they want to solve through some design solution. Um, and the engineers are looking at refining that problem to really understand what's going on. So you really don't even have to come in with a general design idea. You need to come in with a problem that you think a design solution could help solve that problem um, because the team can walk you through a few design options and do some risk analysis comparison, um, looking at what design might better solve your problem. Um, they will ask a lot about who your users are um, to understand how this will um, help you solve your problem across the span or the use of the device. And then um, they'll also work on some of the manufacturability, some of those types of pieces that further down the road could help move the product along um, from a, a market standpoint. Um, and all of this work then can result in a different level of output that you're looking for. So it may just result in a SolidWorks drawing that you then would take on for the physical prototype to one of these other um, individuals. It could result in a um, rough prototype using some of the re machining resources they have, um, but it's a fairly low bar from a financial um, and time um, aspect. And you can really be early in the game looking at how we can solve this problem and how we can bring some um, different innovative solutions um, and people working on the, the project. Hey, very good. Um, are we, is that through senior capstone projects primarily? And then what sort of disciplines um, have you been able to engage with? Correct. So it is the, the senior design project for their capstone project at the end of the um, undergraduate senior engineering program. And the, pro, the different departments that we've worked with are biological systems engineering, um, mechanical and materials engineering. So they do can do a lot as well, like with which specific materials would be helpful for this um, design. And then um, we've done a little bit with the electrical and computer engineering group. Yeah, very good, very cool. Um, and then just to follow up to that, so engaging, how would, so if say I'm a faculty interested, I have an idea, how would I engage with you then to, to get into your pipeline? So right now it would be connecting to, with me directly, um, and we are going to be submitting a call here soon um, with projects due in April um, to gather some of these project ideas and then link people to the best resources. And so thankfully I'm connected with all people on this panel, so if 
the senior design project is not the right um, option for them because of the scope of the project or where they're at in the, the process, then I will certainly um, send people to the other resources that they have available and the other people that can help connect them. Um, as well as there, we anticipate some instances where the senior capstone project still isn't the right route, but connecting them with an engineering faculty member, um, looking at options to work with a graduate student in an engineering program. Um, as in my role, I'm also serving kind of as a, a concierge to help with those um, connections, as well as some of the barriers they have with moving those projects forward. Very good. Um, and then I'll just continue on with you, Bethany, and then kind of work my way back around through the rest of the panel. But a little more, if you could, a little more detail of what's that process like then? Um, what's kind of a timeline and what are some sort of expected deliverables? Um, and if there was any particular project you wanted to sort of highlight um, or discuss as well, please feel free. Sure. So we are going to submit, have this call for projects that we are going to ask people to send by the end of April so that in May we can meet with the program um, coordinators for the senior capstone projects so that by the fall they have them ready for the students to choose and select their project. Um, we can scope them out to determine whether or not they're appropriate as a senior capstone project or if we need to connect them with other resources. Uh, if they are appropriate for a senior capstone project, the, the project would start in the fall semester. So August, early September, students usually reach out um, and start understanding the problem, asking questions, um, visiting with the client, and then um, working on prototyping usually by the end of that semester or the beginning of the next semester. So December into January, or February, and to do some initial testing with that prototype, um, or at least have uh, a 3D drawing to discuss. Um, in the fall, you will set up your expectations on what deliverables you're asking for. Um, obviously, there can be a conversation if you want a prototype that can be taken into the hospital um, and be used right away. That's not feasible um, for this level of work. But um, if you want something maybe to be used in the simulation center, um, talking about maybe a smaller subset of users interacting with it to understand how people use it, um, that might be within the scope of the project. And so that's decided upon in the fall. You meet um, about every month or every couple of weeks with the team to help make sure that they're on track to get updates on the, their progress. And then um, by the end of April, they will be done with their project. And then based off of what you decided on the deliverable, whether or not it's a physical prototype or a 3D drawing, um, they will have something for you at that point. Um, and we, um, have had success in some of those um, rough prototypes so that clients can both maybe have a, a 3D drawing, but then also have something physical to interact with. Right now, we're working on a um, system to help prevent falls when patients are getting out of bed. Um, and so we already have some initial um, prototypes that we're going to be able to test with our OTPT folks in the simulation center. Um, they won't be ready for cleaning appropriately. They won't have all the padding on them, but they will be able to be moved in that space so um, users can test them out and see how they interact with them when caring for the patient or as a patient um, and how they can help uh, prevent those falls. So. Hey, very cool, thank you. Uh, Brian Moss, I think you did a pretty good job describing how how easy it is to to schedule you and get access to the to the uh, Jim and Karen Linder Maker Studio. Do you want to talk a little bit um, about some of the the equipment you have in there that people can access? And then, do you want to highlight too this this speaker seminar series you guys are organizing over there? Sure. Yeah, we have um, just a wall of basic hand tools. We have just real basic um, powered power tools as well, nothing that creates a lot of sawdust really. But um, the main thing that people are into use are the 3D printers. And uh, for that, we have uh, TAS 5 and Ultimaker S5 available. That's our primary ones that people use, filament printers. We also have the Form 3 uh, resin printer. And then we also have a, we have an old Prusa that 
is kind of our tinkering toy. It's like if you want to put it together and get it working, you can use it. Um, I can't guarantee it'll be working the day you get here. We don't formally support it, but it's more for people who want a little hands-on, uh, take apart, put together kind of stuff without um, destroying our workhorse computer our printers. And we have a, another printer upstairs that we use more for requests that we are printing for people. And the speaker series just started in the fall. We had our first one was um, Dr. Bennett from the College of Dentistry. And it's uh, afternoon, um, kind of like we always, the libraries always had speaker series for authors. And this is kind of another part of the library services we wanted to highlight. So um, the next one will be in the fall. And we're always looking for people who are interested in presenting what they're doing with 3D printing in this uh, ser series. And that we may end up um, doing it once a semester instead, but for now we're just doing it once in the fall each year. And yeah, we had a quick follow-up um, from the audience, Brian. Um, our, uh, just to clarify, um, is access to the Linder Maker Studio only for university um, staff, employees, students, faculty, or can uh, non-university members also get access? Would, it's just the uh, UNMC faculty, staff, and students. You have to have a badge that can scan you to get into the library even. And then you'd also have to have the badge activated to the Maker Studio door. So if te technically the library is not open to anybody unless you have a badge or somebody with a badge to let you in. Very good, thank you. Okay, on to you, Noah. So if you could detail a little more about what the process is like for faculty who are interested in working with you and engaging with the students. Um, um, if you have an example of a project or a few projects you wanna highlight. Um, and then if you can maybe share a little bit about um, how your resources and especially the resources at Metro are available to non-university members as well as anyone in the community. Great. Yeah, so as an intake process, uh, there's a number of ways that people can uh, come to me and uh, the MCC students as well. So now that you're meeting me in formats like this, you're welcome to reach out to me directly and I'd be happy to engage you from the get go. I believe Dr. Lowndes mentioned something that uh, along the lines of um, all you need is a problem. And I really like that. Uh, if you have your problem and that's it, uh, that's the time to start reaching out for help, especially if you're overwhelmed and, and very busy with research and um, your daily responsibilities, uh, we want to help. And we're all networked together to provide, you know, a good system for helping with that. So reaching out to me directly is a way, but also um, participating in events like we recently had a back of napkin contest, which was a successful way to solicit maybe that basic problem with an initial sketch or, or just some words going with it to describe the problem and maybe where you're going with it. Um, these kind of things then can get funneled to me if appropriate uh, from organizations like Unimed. And then I can be brought in along with the team to, to further help from there. Um, I'll just put it out there. If, if anyone thinks that I could be of help on a project, including Dr. Lowndes, Dr. Nahr, um, Brian Moss, you know, you're welcome to bring me in and I'd be happy to meet up one-on-one -on -one with inventors to see how I could contribute. I really enjoy meeting people uh, where they're at with their skills and working from there. So if you happen to have already designed skills and have done some sketches and we work with some inventors who are proliferate like that and, and well-versed and experienced in doing sketches on their own, um, then we pick up the pace and we work with them wherever they're at. So we may end up just jumping right into having students do 3D printing or something for someone, which uh, I think everyone can acknowledge, although we want that to be an automated and easy process, uh, it often takes a lot of babysitting, you know, like a, an eight to 10 hour print that, that goes wrong somewhere like an hour into it. And uh, we don't check back in on it for the other eight hours only to find it goes wrong. But then we realize the value of having like maybe students who are actually present in the laboratory and can kind of babysit that process. 
So uh, we hope that our team can be available to, you know, help out in ways like that, as well as more advanced um, design needs and even up to uh, simple manufacturing. So uh, for some projects, we see that it might start out with just some CAD drawing and blueprints and go on to a very basic 3D print um, where maybe the key features aren't actually present, but labeled. And so we're getting them out there and starting the whole process. But, but it could take months to a year before we actually start getting in the features in some kind of functional way into that prototype to fully advance it. And at that point, we need to we need to call in uh, more experienced teams, or even go out into the community for external uh, manufacturing assistance or something like that. And uh, that's another way where Unitech can be of help as an accelerator to make those contacts and maybe find the monies or uh, support needed to advance prototypes even further to later stages. Yeah, thank you, Noah. Um, can you give an example, maybe put you on the spot of something that's more mechanically simplistic, um, that's been easier to sort of additively manufacture, um, and then maybe something that's on a little more on the other end of the spectrum uh, that you're working on, um, you know, maybe not getting into too much of the details of, of the design, but. Sure, sure. Something, uh, something relatively easy, maybe. Uh, would be a recent submission for a, a device that was a precision syringe, which just allowed a lot more motor control over the syringe. It had a different kind of plunger in it. And um, that, that kind of design was fairly simple to cut out, although I wasn't involved in the beginning of it. But uh, you can imagine getting a basic print of a syringe, fairly simple, um, getting that so that it could actually be functional in um, usage and testing and appropriate, um, that's like another level of development there. And then going on to get a prototype produced in a stage that's close to how it would look coming off manufacturing was another iteration of that. So we had, it was all using additive manufacturing, but in different stages, probably leading up to it being injection molded as a final stage. And, um, you know, we, we had touch points at all of those stages. Um, some more advanced prototypes that we get in that require a lot more help are where there's multiple elements, maybe electronic components. Uh, there could be a degree of uh, uh, danger to the user or safety involved, like with um, high electrical currents without giving too much away about the project. Uh, excessive heat, um, sharp implements like scalpels and things like that, and, and combining all of these and possibly integrating robotics. Now we get into a design that's probably beyond what most of our uh, prototyping students at Metro Community College are capable of. Although the great experience for them is uh, they've had a little bit of coursework in each of those categories, robotics, basic digital electronics, things like that. So to be involved in the project early on and identifying those features and uh, starting to do the initial research on where even to hand that portion of the prototyping off to is all valuable experience for myself, for those students. And then it just increases our networking with um, our fellow organizations we're working with here to further the prototype. Excellent. Thank you, Noah. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good segue back over to Brian Nar. We haven't heard from him in a little while. So that that's it. <laughs> Noah's describing uh, at the end there a, a device for that would be used during laparoscopic surgery. Um, that 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 we're gonna pass over to Brian and hopefully get some help prototyping with his core facility on eventually. Um, Brian, uh, just as a reminder, um, since you're at the end here, kind of weaving our way back, just a little more detail, if you will on what it's like to engage with you, what that process is like, kind of expected timelines. I know it can vary wildly depending on the project. And then maybe if you wanted to highlight a project or two that you've worked on lately. Yeah, so the process for working with us is, is generally pretty simple. Um, we have a, a web page that uh, is on our UNO site. Um, on that, we have links to our, our email address. That's generally the way to contact us. So uh, bmchmpcore 
at unomaha.com. Um, that goes to myself and our two main staff that, are, that work full-time in the shop. Um, alongside that, we have uh, what we call a project initiation form. Um, so if you, you know, have initial ideas, initial drawings, initial um, information for us about your budget or your timeline, things like that, all that's included on the form. Um, if you email us with a project that you're interested in and, and supply that form, that usually gets us a really good start on you know, how to uh, position the project. Uh, from there, we will uh, reach back out and either say, yeah, this is something that seems feasible. Um, let's meet and you know, discuss details and follow up questions that we would have uh, to continue the project. Or it's something that may be outside of our scope in terms of our uh, manufacturing capabilities or expertise. Uh, in general, our focus is on um, custom prototypes and, and small scale um, runs of products. We're not a, a large scale manufacturing house. Um, so I think it was Noah that mentioned, you know, something that might move on to um, injection molding for hundreds of copies of something. We don't do that. Um, we're, the, we're the place that specializes in getting that first couple designs down and working so that then you can take that design out to the shop that can do the, the larger runs of, of products. Um, in terms of you know, ideas and, and projects and, and what we work on, it really does run the gamut. You know, we can um, take any one of our printers or manufacturing um, equipment and, and make one-offs or, or examples of designs. Uh, you know, Tyler just emailed us uh, last week and Noah emailed us last week about uh, a, ma a mask print that uh, they needed with pretty quick turnaround. And we were able to put that in one of our Form 3 printers and turn that around in a couple of days. Um, and that was good for their needs. So we'll make a few more. And then once they know that that's perfect, they'll go make a whole bunch of them somewhere else. Um, uh, we do have a bit of a specialty in kind of combined systems. So as Noah mentioned, when a project gets more complicated and needs a software solution, a hardware solution, electronic solution, um, kind of all together, we do those integrated designs. Um, so we do design um, you know, custom boards, custom electronics, we can you know, implement individual sensors or you know, put, put individual sensors on boards. Um, we can do the software for you know, either collecting sensor information or driving some sort of um, feature. And then we can also manufacture the hardware that might go along with it. Um, uh, we have a, a wide range of projects we've done in the past. Um, we've built a custom uh, treadmill for a squirrel um, that can be used for um, you know, looking at uh, both motor control and balance performance of a squirrel at different inclinations as it's riding on a branch simulator, essentially, um, that also have the ability to be combined with metabolics so they could look at metabolic costs. So um, there's not really a blueprint for how to build a treadmill for a squirrel. And that's a really good example of how we can take that information in, work with the faculty that need that, um, learn a lot about that actual topic or that, that application. Um, we often have to do a lot of uh, that kind of background research to, to get on board with the project because they're often specialized. Um, and then actually, you know, turn around and create something. Uh, we have also built, you know, custom controllers for human treadmills. Um, we have, I'm just looking at some older projects here. Um, We've built uh, or designed some aortic valve stents and um, or aortic valves for hearts and, and custom stents. Um, a lot of these projects are actually projects that are filtered through Unimed in some way. So when um, you know when an inventor has a, a really impactful idea that that needs that um, difficult solution because um, for it to be patentable, it probably is a different difficult solution. Um, we specialize in trying to get that next step going to show that it has the feasibility or patentability um, in the product. Uh, so to summarize, we kind of do a lot of everything. Um, and, and if it involves electronics, software, and or hardware, we generally have the capabilities to do it in-house um, as long as it's on kind of a smaller scale. Um, we, don't, uh, we only have you know, two, two and a half full-time staff um, so, you know, as Noah said, you know, running large sets of, of prints or things like that and having to babysit them, that time is not very effectively used for us. And we don't have the infrastructure to do that as much as we have um, a wide range of tools and, and skills to figure out the problem um, from a manufacturing side. Thank you, Brian. 
Uh, just a quick follow up too for you. What is, you know, because I know a lot of faculty think about this. What's the time commitment like if someone does want to work with you? If someone doesn't want to work with us? If they do, sorry. So oh, okay. <laughs> well, like, I'm sure people don't want to work with us. Um, <laughs> no, if they, if they do want to work with us, it's going to highly vary on, on project, right? So if it's uh, that they, they need a print run or they need a, a part manufactured, uh, you know, out of a aluminum plate or something like that timetable uh, is going to vary a little bit on our, our current load. We do run about 10 to 15 projects simultaneously at any time, run, running from very long, big projects to very, you know, kind of short one-offs. Um, if we're really inundated, it might take an extra week to get around to that print, um, but the turnaround would be, you know, a couple of days once we get to it. Um, and we try to be upfront about that um, anytime, uh, you know, those smaller asks come in. For longer projects, um, we do our best to estimate, here's what we think we can get to at different milestones along that project, whether it's month by month or quarterly by quarterly, um, and, and do our best to then check in and either schedule regular meetings with uh, the faculty or, or the, the customer, um, or provide regular updates for how things are progressing. In, a lot of these projects, they're highly experimental, um, which makes it very difficult to predict, right? So, um, and oftentimes, you know, targets may change. So um, we, the, the customer may think they want something particular in day one. And then once they start seeing it halfway done, they say, oh, wait, we got to pivot and we need this different, or we need something else about this, or we need a new sensor, or, or this, this solution isn't working the way I thought it would. Um, so it is highly iterative and, and highly collaborative in that sense. Um, so we do our best early on to try to estimate where we think we can get from a, a straightforward description to, um, to that end goal. And then likely here's where there are things that the questions that may be iterated or this may be a multi-part process. Um, so we'll do the first phase and then see where we're at and go from there. Um, it is, um, again, I think when working with us, the best thing to understand is um, we don't have the answer either yet, and we have to go figure it out. Um, so uh, when you're coming to us for the answer, it, we don't do your work, we don't do your research, or we don't, you know, we didn't invent your, you know, we don't have your problem, um, that we don't see it in the same way, right, daily. So there are often things that come up, and that, that can be a benefit, right? We have fresh eyes to the problem, so we may see a, an alternate solution or a different path. Um, but that collaborative nature and that willingness to work together on finding that solution, I think, is um, where our, our core becomes very valuable as well. I, I completely agree. And then a quick follow up again to Brian, um, your core facility is available, not just for university affiliated folks, but for, for the community as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we are um, we're an NIH sponsored uh, core facility, which means we have um, we offer our services to the internal uh, uh, NU um, and NU affiliated uh, uh, field, as well as anyone in the community. So, um, you know, we've actually done some projects with like student groups and, and high schools where they, you know, they had a design that they made for, um, I think one was like a wheelchair, a custom wheelchair ramp, um, and they needed somewhere to build it. They didn't have the facility, they didn't have the fabrication you know, means, and so they were able to come to us and we were able to put it together for them for their um, for their kind of school project. So anything from that to larger scale customers that you know you think they may have some invention that they have that's completely unrelated to the medical field or the research field, um, but we have the fabrication and the facilities to do it. Uh, and we've done projects like that as well. So it can, again, it can look any way and shape you, you can imagine. Um, as long as we're able to do it and we're able to kind of communicate effectively on the project, it, it will likely be a success. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, please, if you have any questions in the audience, please submit them through the chat or raise your hand. I can call on you. Um, I think our preference is chat. If you can just type them up. I've gotten a few through the chat. It's worked pretty well. Um, we'll just run back through then. Um, we'll go back to, to uh, Bethany um, and just kind of run back through. What's, um, what's one thing you wish I would have asked? What's something we haven't talked about yet that you that I've forgotten to ask you? Um. You actually kind of touched on it, um, but I'm going to further elaborate on kind of the like a cautionary tale or kind of expectations going into this. Um, and I mentioned that having something ready to go into, like be working in the application that you're looking at, that's 
the biggest challenge with this piece is even if you think it's a fairly simple design um, and that you could get it going right away, it's probably, I mean, especially in healthcare, needing FDA approval. We've done some projects that they would technically not need FDA approval because they're not a true um, medical application, but something would be helpful in the hospital. And um, it's still challenging to plan on something working right away because this group, while they do some initial usability testing just to kind of see if it functions more feasibility testing, um, really thinking about how the users will be interacting with it, how it will be maintained um, can be a challenge. So coming in with expectations, as some others have mentioned on it being this first round to get a prototype, something in place that you can look at, interact with, um, understand how it works to think about that next iteration is a benefit. Um, and, and it's helpful knowing going into that, that you're trying something out, you're looking at how this will work um, and you're ready to work with people to um, realize that, that design um, in that early stage. Very good, thanks, Bethany. Um, over to you, Brian Moss. Uh, what's, what's something I've forgotten to ask you that you'd like to highlight about, about the Maker Studio over there? I think Bethany, I'll follow her, her uh, lead on this and do some cautionary tale. It's uh, just basically don't wait to the last minute to engage, to, to use our space. Um, we have limited numbers of printers and if you come in the night before something's due and think you're gonna have it available overnight, you might be sadly mistaken. The um, earlier you plan, the, the better you plan and the earlier you get in, the more chance that we can help and that you will be able to complete whatever you need in time. Yeah, I think I forgot to ask you too, Brian, what are some examples of things that either research students or faculty or clinical, you know, educational, what are some examples of things that have been printed over there? Sure. The, um, we had a student who came by. They, they were needed to do a practice uh, hip replacement in the anatomy lab in the cadavers. And the artificial or the you know, dummy hip was uh, going to be a couple hundred dollars and take a couple weeks to get here for them to order. And we were able to find a file online of one printed up really dense in a, just standard you know, PLA plastic. And the next morning, that student was able to take it to class and use it. And everybody else in class was jealous because they had, he had saved the money and time. And um, that's on the student side. And uh, we've had some staff members who've designed, uh, so I guess instructional designers who've, in, who've designed molds that they can pour silicone into. And the mold, when you pop it back out, is the shape of different shapes of cuts. So they can practice suturing different styles or different tying. Um, we do lots of little things like that that is maybe making edu the, edu the faculty members use as tools for teaching. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, there's tremendous applications in medical education. And I know you have a, you kind of have a wall or display just all around there of different 3D printed objects too. So if anyone's interested, please, I'd encourage you all to go check it out. Um, yeah, we try to keep, we, we keep things around. And then first thing when people walk in, I tell them you can touch any of this. It's all anything we've printed for practice, anything we've had bad failures on, we keep just as an instructional tool for ourselves. And we print primarily in PLA, which is the hard plastic. And, but we also use TPU, which is a softer, squishy one. So I have some hearts that you can actually squeeze and, and have different textures and things. We have several other materials that are available, but we haven't really used a lot. We haven't had a, a case for them. Fantastic. Um, on to you, Noah. What's something I've forgotten to ask you that you would like to highlight? Uh, so following up on what Brian was just saying, I'd like to highlight that uh, the Linder Maker Studio is excellent in its available resources for 3D printing. That Ultimaker that they have over there is uh, really easy to get up and running on fairly quickly. And both Brian and myself would be happy to get anyone going on a project on that, especially if you're interested in other materials that are appropriate for filaments. Um, it, it's just really convenient how it has like six different filaments that can be loaded into the machine and it will automatically change those for you. 
And at the time that it does, if you're defining a certain material, it will load presets for that material. Um, all of this helps make the process way more simple than doing all that manually and the big learning curve involved in that. Um, that being said, it's not a perfect process. And the more customized you're making an object and also depending on the design, it, it may take a few prints to get the good one, even when you're doing everything right and have all the perfect settings. So I myself have done some TPU prints there recently and gotten some softer prints with good results. Um, also with the resin printer, I know they have additional resins available, uh, for example, like high temperature resins for special applications. And a new resource over there that uh, we're still uh, working towards getting some initial prototypes on is a desktop injection molder. And that's a great resource to have. Um, even though it's an injection molder and we tend to think high volume with this type of equipment, um, it, it'd be more in a mid range of uh, maybe producing a few hundred of an item, but not thinking like thousands or actually taking it to market, but perhaps enough for an extended study or something like that. Um, the disclaimer on that is it's very small print volume and also uh, requires a very simple design for injection molding as it's a basic machine, but that's an exciting new resource over there. Yeah, another, sure. dis another disclaimer on that is um, if you want help with it, you have to call Noah, not us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks again for, for housing that injection molder, Brian. Thank you. And thanks now for getting that up and running. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Nar, what's one question I've forgotten to ask you? What's something you'd like to highlight? Yeah, one other thing I wanted to highlight um, was just our status as, the, as an NIH sponsored core. Um, what that means is when you're you know, thinking about your invention, if you're looking for funding specifically from the NIH, um, we are very easy to write into grants and budgets um, and are um, looked very favorably on from NIH proposals when, when utilized. So um, our rates are currently subsidized by the NIH. Um, and to use us, it's simply talk to us, request a quote, put that number in your operating line for your grant. Um, and you're off to the races. There's uh, really little asked about um, the process of using our core. So um, even from like supplies um, and, and how you would actually go about fabricating a device, they don't ask any questions on that. They know that the core is going to handle that as long as you say, we're using the core to make it. Um, so it actually can really streamline the process of, of integrating you know, device development and device fabrication into a grant process. Um, and that goes for the other federal agencies as well, but NIH specifically, as our you know our status with the NIH is um, is so close. But it's it's a unique opportunity. Certainly, you know, faculty over here and myself, we do it for our projects um, all the time, and we're always happy to help um, kind of walk you through that process if needed. Very good, thanks, Dr. Nar. Um, okay, we do have a couple of questions quickly here at the end. So perfect. So besides um, everyone on this panel. Is there someone else you're aware of within UNO, UNMC, who can help with, with CAD modeling and CAD support? Um, so uh, I'll start with Dr. Nar. Is there someone I, that I should have included or we need to include in a future panel or that our faculty can seek out? Um, are some of our students, I guess. <laughs> um, oftentimes our students that are, are skilled in those ways though uh, are actually employed by the core. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of that, you know, initial CAD work ourselves um, when needed. We have uh, uh, several like very highly trained experts in CAD on our staff. Um, and those projects actually end up being quite small um, because they're quite efficient with their time. So I would say, you know, even if it's a small ask or a small small part or something simple in terms of geometry, um, we can offer that service and we can essentially crank that out very quickly um, because of our expertise. So it, it doesn't become a very large bill or a large ask for, for the core itself. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, over to you, Noah. What's, uh, you, you can probably highlight Metro Community College a little more and that Center for Advanced and Emerging Tech and some of your students and um, faculty over there. Yeah, I would say we range from, uh, and myself included, a uh, level of beginner to intermediate expertise with the CAD designs with a focus on 
actually uh, producing those designs in some sort of physical prototype. So if your design gets to the point where there's a complexity of like mechanical and moving parts, maybe that also uh, could lead to a need for simulation of some kind within the CAD software, uh, then that's the point where I would be seeking additional help from someone like Dr. Nahr and uh, the advanced students over there um, at UNO Biomechanics. And uh, what we'd specialize in is that initial upfront rough modeling. Hopefully, the benefit of that is informing that later process by getting a lot of kinks out of the way, uh, usually concurrent to while additional research is going into what existing maybe patents are currently out there and how does that affect the design as oftentimes designs come in one way and what what may be a fairly complete design to the inventor actually may need a lot of revision in order to uh, position it correctly within the market of current offerings uh, if they weren't aware that there's already very similar products on the market so uh, yeah, that combined with the level of complexity will inform what we can work with initially. Thank you, Noah. Dr. Lowndes, um, are you familiar with what other uh, resources are available for university um, affiliated customers through the College of Engineering maybe in Lincoln? I am not right now. I will have to look okay. into that and I can definitely provide some feedback. I mean, the students take a, a, a CAS or SolidWorks course um, and so and they're looking for projects during that. So whether or not they could work on a project, but it would definitely be that ba basic, you know, um, level where they're starting off on the learning. Um, but I am not familiar with other um, direct support um, through the innovation campus. That's the space yeah. in the old. Um, State fairgrounds, there might be some resources there, but I, I'm not familiar with them. Yeah, sorry to put you on the spot. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, um, the only things I can think of, the physics department has some CNC, they can do some metal work. Um, uh, and yeah, and as you said, the there's a big maker studio over on Innovation Campus as well. And I don't, I'm not super familiar. Um, Noah, you actually, you, you toured that recently, didn't you? Yes, I was there for the, there was a library and maker studio conference there that uh, Brian and myself attended, Brian Moss. And uh, they have quite an impressive facility there as well. But as far as the design goes, it feels more like uh, people are coming in with their existing designs and more making use of the equipment there. And I, I wasn't hearing that actual design was one of the main services, but um, I, I, I shouldn't speak for them. They may have a different intake process for that. Uh, they're probably well networked within the community too, to be able to make referrals to someone external like uh, Omaha Custom Manufacturing comes to mind, you know, or uh, there may be additional design firms available. Yeah, there's a number of companies in Omaha and Lincoln who probably would be willing to take on some initial CAD modeling and stuff for a price, right? Um, uh, Brian Moss, finally, I know the university is, you know, trying to um, pool resources right among campuses. What, what's that look like among, you know, maker resources with all the libraries across campus? Are you familiar at all with, you know, for example, what UNO has to offer in their in their library and the Chris Library and maybe what what Lincoln or UNK have? Oh yeah, UNO has uh, the library has a maker studio there that's open to. UNO students, faculty and staff, kind of on a walk-in basis. It's probably similar to ours, but maybe with a few more machines and they do have laser cutters there and uh, a, a lot of video production equipment and things like that, that we don't have. Uh, UNK hasn't done anything yet, but their public library in Kearney is an extensive system, a second uh, makerspace. And UNL's library is also deferring to the innovation campus. I think since that's on campus, they aren't really doing much with it at this point. Um, another option for people in Omaha is the Do Space has available printers, laser cutters, et cetera. And those are open to anybody. Really, if you walk in and you have an address, they'll give you a card and you can schedule a time. 
but it's like ours in that it's very much do it yourself. So they aren't going to uh, sit with you and work on things, but they also do have every month, they have several different classes that they offer that you can do currently by Zoom. And I assume in the future it'll be in person. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, perfect. Um, and then we had one, oh yeah, I guess we got another reference. So you mentioned do space. Thanks, Brian. Um, also, uh, Teethon 3D here in town does ceramics printing, just another local 3D printing company. There's uh, Shabri does additive manufacturing out of, out of Hastings, Nebraska, I believe is where they're headquartered under Nebraska 3D printing. I can't think of any other uh, 3D printing companies. I'm sure I'm, I'm missing somebody, but um, if anyone has questions about that, please, you can follow up with anyone else on this panel um, or myself, and we can we can track down some additional modeling help potentially. Um, the final question was just on intellectual property during the prototyping process. Um, so I know from our perspective at Unimed, if, if uh, someone contributes meaningfully to the conception or the embodiment of a design, um, th they're going to be considered an inventor. Um, or a co-inventor. Does anyone on this panel have anything else you'd want to share about how they view intellectual property? I know just from like an additive manufacturing or uh, 3D printing perspective, it's it's somewhat antithetical to the open source 3D printing movement. I know it's, it's something I've always kind of struggled with <laughs> as a 3D printing enthusiast. Um, I'll just open it up though. To the, does anyone on the panel have anything they want to mention about um, how they view intellectual property during the prototyping process? I can mention a few things just because it, it often comes up in the work that we do. Um, typically, you know, we work really closely with Unimed Unitech on um, determining IP and understanding, you know, when IP is um, potentially going to be, you know, towards some of the inventors in the shop or stays alone with the inventor that kind of brought the project along. Um, we are happy to either route um, is the one thing I really wanted to mention. You come to us with a design and an idea and they're wholly your designs and ideas and you want us to implement that um, through just fabrication um, we can do that um, and, and we have done that on many projects and kind of hand it over and, and there you go um, where that often gets muddied is when um, you ask for our advice or our, our input in a design or in a, in a concept um, and, and once that process happens, that's kind of what opens the door to potentially um, uh, having claim to intellectual property. And as Tyler said, um, we follow exactly what he said in terms of if we're contributing to a design, if we're contributing to solving a problem um, that was either unforeseen or, or, um, or foreseen in a way that uh, the inventor, original inventor did not have a solution and we find that solution, um, typically, that usually means we've contributed to the intellectual property of the of the device. But um, we are, as I said, we're UNO uh, NU system affiliated, so um, we go through Unimed, and um, and ultimately, a lot of those determinations are made by that IP office. Um, generally, what we do is just document everything, and and that decision is made by uh, people who know know a lot more about patent law than I do. Thanks, Dr. Nari. I just echo his statement there at the end. If you have any questions about that, please follow up with me or um, I can help direct you internally at Unimed as needed too. We can we can have a further discussion on intellectual property. We love to do it. Um, so I think we're about at the end here. I want to wrap it up. Uh, thanks again to all our panelists. Thanks so much for being a part of this um, and sharing your expertise and time. Uh, just as a quick reminder here, we will have um, noon panels. Uh, like this uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, so please check out the Unimed website um, to see if uh, you've probably gotten some emails about those as well. Please attend. They'll be similarly excellent. Um, and then our, our our Innovation Awards banquet on Thursday over the noon hour as well. So thanks again, everybody. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day.